Uh, again, Lord, we uh, ask that you would speak to us. I think of this beautiful uh, text before us, how you uh, audibly spoke to Zechariah uh, in the house of the Lord as he was faithful to come and to do his work and to be present with you and others. And God, I pray that we who have gathered here this morning um, might receive these words from you this morning and that they would be for us, that you would speak to us, Lord. Uh, we think of Samuel long ago, also in your house, saying, Speak, Lord, your servant's listening. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, some of you, some of you have probably been to the great capital uh, city of Ireland, Dublin. Many of you probably have not, but um, it's in some ways it's like just a lot of cities where you go there to walk around and maybe you go there to shop or you go there for certain, I was going to say food, but that's not really true in Ireland so much. You go there for Guinness or you go there to go to the Guinness brewery or to go to the pubs and to listen to great music and that kind of thing. Um, you, what you may not know, and I think this is actually kind of an interesting statistic, is that the number uh, one most visited place there is actually the zoo. Most people go to the zoo. It's the number one attraction in, in terms of most visitors there. And, and the second big attraction, of course, there's the Guinness Brewery, but the really big attraction there that lots of people talk about is the Book of Kells. The Book of Kells. Some of you know what the Book of Kells is. Others of you may not, but it's a, it's a gospel text. It's, it's a, a book that contains the four gospels that tell us about Jesus. And it's wildly ornamental and it's very, very beautiful. Um, our gospel text, if some of you have looked through this, actually it has different paintings and it's, it's really lovely too. I'd actually encourage you to look at it. It was done by Mako uh, Fujimura um, more recently, but the book of Kells actually comes to us from about 800. That's when we think that it was uh, done. It was um, painted and written out by monks long ago. Actually, it's kind of wild to think that that's much closer to the time of Jesus than we are to that text. You know, so it's, it's, it's an ancient text. Um, well, I once went and saw this, this famous book. I was in college. One of my good friends, Ryan Griffith, who looks as Irish as his name sounds, um, bright red hair. He and I uh, got tickets from Seattle, and we went over to Dublin and to Ireland for a little while. Um, and since he looks so Irish, we actually had Guinness bought for us, I think, every single night because everyone's like, how? Your old brother. Um, but we went and saw the Book of Kells at Trinity College, which is right in the heart of Dublin. And it's really interesting because it, there's a long line, but what the curators of this exhibit have done is they sort of force you to make your way through the library, observing all these other ancient manuscripts that are around you. And also there's the occasional plaque that you're looking at, you're reading, and you're learning about ancient Celtic Christianity and the practices of um, making paper in the ancient days and writing utensils and paint and just how labor intensive the creation of this text would have been. And so you, by the time you get to this, what they have done is they've slowed you down and they've prepared your mind and even they've prepared your heart to receive this text a little bit more for what it is. Um, it's a totally different experience than just sort of buying your ticket and immediately, immediately going up to it. And they only have it turned to one page at a time, so you only get to look at one page. Um, but going up and looking at it and leaving, they for, sort of forced you to say, here's what you're about to engage with. So we've been in this genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, and we've looked at these, these women that are mentioned there in the genealogy. And what I've suggested to you is um, one of the things that, that the New Testament author of Matthew is doing for us is he's saying, prepare yourself. Uh, slow down a bit. Try to understand what it is that's coming when we say Jesus is coming. Right? We've said that Jesus is this one who brings this scandalous mercy in the midst of just such wild experiences, wild stories, and, and people that we think maybe they're foregone. But God comes to us, outsiders and estranged people, and risk takers and all this kind of stuff. 
Well, um, one of the things I've said is that what the, what the New Testament author is doing is he's not just writing history, but he's trying to actually give you a theology. He's not just telling you sort of the, you know, the whens and the whos and the whats. He's trying to actually invite you into this story of what God is doing in Jesus. So Elizabeth is not one of the women that's mentioned in Matthew, but she's mentioned in Luke and she's mentioned before we come to Jesus. Okay. This key woman who's mentioned before we come to Jesus, actually in the gospel of Luke, Matthew begins at least by saying this is the genealogy of Jesus, but Luke doesn't even mention Jesus by name until verse 31. So this whole text happens before Jesus is even mentioned. Um, And uh, Luke here, instead, through this preparation time, gives us this story of John the Baptist and his parents, Zechariah, this priest, and his wife, Elizabeth, who is the cousin we we will learn of um, Jesus' mother, Mary. Um, So what I want to do here is I want us to focus on Elizabeth. And what I want us to do also is just ask this simple question that we've been asking as we've looked at these various women. How do they prepare us to understand Jesus? How is this narrative actually shaping us so that we might receive Christ rightly? Let me say this. Uh, David read for us this beautifully beautiful text, and it's a rather long text. And a lot of this passage is dealing with Zechariah. And, and there's actually some really good things that we can sit in and meditate on. I mean, God speaks to Zechariah in the context of his house, which he so often does. He still does that today. Um, and actually, we could even just reflect on this idea that he mentions incense three times and the theology of the smoke and the presence of God and this kind of stuff. We could sit on that. Or we could consider the role of John the Baptist that's, of course, rather extensively mentioned in this passage all I'm doing, just because I know some of you will be like, you skipped over so much. I know y'all don't really do that much for me, but, you know, I'm just, meant, I'm just focusing on Elizabeth, okay? That's what we're going to focus on this morning. So Elizabeth. And what do we learn about Elizabeth in this text? Okay, the first thing we learn about Elizabeth in this text is that, well, this all takes place. She's living in the time of Herod, the king of Judea, which might not mean a whole lot to you. um, But to the people living at that time, it meant a lot. Um, It was very significant. Herod was a Roman ruler, which was very significant in and of itself because the Jews would have known deep down their hearts that there should have been a Jewish person leading them on on the throne. It should have been a descendant of David on the throne. And for a Jew that was really seeking after God, that would have brought them back to this reality that the Jews as a whole had rebelled against the Lord, had collectively sinned to an extent that God actually exiled them and then they were brought back and their king really was not on the throne again as they should have been. Things got worse and worse. And Herod represents in some ways for someone like Elizabeth, this long story of God's people. But this fact that somebody else is ruling that should not be ruling. The other thing that you need to know about Herod is that Herod is both a great ruler and a terrible ruler. He's kind of more like, actually, maybe I should say it like this. He's a great leader. He's a terrible ruler. He's a great leader because actually he got tons done. He rebuilt a lot of stuff. He added to the temple actually in Jerusalem. But he was also terrible. He... He built lots of temples to pagan gods in and around Jerusalem and in Judea. And beyond this, you all likely know the story that we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Herod is the one that commands the children two years and younger around Bethlehem to be slaughtered. This is Herod. Okay. So Elizabeth lives in this time of upheaval, um, a, a, a time when sin had laid to waste sort of the the great desires of the people of God. And you could actually see this just in in the architecture, in the life around you. This was reinforced for you all the time. Um, Things were not as they were meant to be, okay? The rough places were really rough. And the deep valleys of sorrow and sadness were really deep. Okay, the next thing we learn about Elizabeth is that... um, 
He had, a, this is the uh, end of verse five, the second half. And he had a wife, meaning Zechariah, from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. So what, one thing we learn about Elizabeth is that she is one of the daughters of Aaron. Uh, which is to say this, she came from a religious family. And not just any religious family, but like the religious family. Aaron was the first of the chief priests, the high priests. Um, so her family had religious pedigree. You could say it like this. She was an OG pastor's kid, right? The original gangster pastor kid. Um, and so, so she is sort of raised in the life of the church and a life of faithfulness and has this pedigree, this heritage. Okay. Um, the third thing that we learn about Elizabeth is that she's righteous before God, right? Um, verse six, and they were both, Zachariah and Elizabeth, righteous before God, which is to say she was in good standing before the Lord. Uh, she knew the ways of God. She knew that her sin was great, but God's grace was even greater. Uh, you could say she was justified in his sight. She had true faith in the work of God for her. Um, and this is actually, this is significant, but it, because if you know the story of Israel, it's not a foregone conclusion that someone who's a priest is actually faithful. Not remotely, just like it is in our own days. And priests and priests' family, um, and it's just like today. You know, you can be raised, you can be in this religious family, you can be from the OG religious family, and you can just give up on it all. You can think, this is not for me. God's dead anyway. But that's not Elizabeth's story. God's alive, and she has a living relationship with God. The thing we learn immediately after that is um, that this relationship with God was not something that was stale or stagnant, but it was really alive and it bore fruit in her life. Um, so that righteousness actually lived out in her day-to-day -day life. What it says, this is, uh, they were walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. What you can say now is she sought to put on Christ in her life, right? Um, her life bore fruit of the living God. Which is just to say this woman's not faking it, right? This is a devout person. Someone who's not, you know, just showing up to church just because like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. Somebody else told me to come along or I feel guilty if I don't. You know, they've actually tasted of the love of God and they want to bear that fruit in their lives. She wants to demonstrate that love. But here's, here's the next thing we learn. And this is sort of where this story really gets going. Verse 7. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Which is to say, it's not that she didn't want children. It's that she couldn't have children. Uh, she was barren. And some of you know this state. You literally know this state in your life, right? Um, you have had the long desire for children, and that desire has never been met. And you just know the pain of that long desire not being met. I mean, Proverbs tells us that hope deferred makes the heart sick. It's the long, long deferment of hope. Um, some of you know other things like other, other aspects of barrenness. Maybe you've long desired a spouse and that hasn't happened. Or you've long desired a job that brings a level of deep fulfillment in your life. And that's just never happened. You know, just this long barrenness. The, the fact is, my guess is that actually every single one of us, when we begin to contemplate this on some level, can empathize with Elizabeth and Zachariah and their long, you know, unfulfilled waiting. Um, I mean, our desires uh, are always difficult when they go unmet. And, and what we're told here is that she, you know, th this was a barrenness with regards to childbearing. And, and we could even say that was a holy desire. I mean, wasn't, didn't God make, you know, humankind, male and female, and then say, be fruitful? 
You know, she could say, this is exactly what you even told me to desire. Why would I live a life of barrenness? Um, you know, we long to use our creativity maybe for the blessing of others, but that creativity maybe seems to go nowhere in our lives. It doesn't bear the fruit that we desire it to bear. Um, it's December 31st, which, by the way, it's actually 1231.23, which is 123123. Write it out, kid. It's kind of fun. Um, and so it's time to make resolutions again, right? Um, maybe we'll read more this year. We're going to get in shape this year. We're going to lose those pounds from the Christmas, 12 days of Christmas, right? We're going to connect with our friends more intentionally this year. Because we don't want barren minds or barren hearts or barren relationships. Barren bodies. Barrenness. You know, I, I looked up uh, synonyms for barrenness. Listen, some of these fit best when we talk about land. Barrenness can be a desert, a dry and fallow, a waste place where nothing grows. And that's actually how we feel, right? Um, and sometimes that's what we experience. Uh, here's some other synonyms. Uh, impoverished. Desolate empty, parched. Uh, I have children. I have three children who I'm deeply blessed by. But all of those words are familiar. Those aren't strange or foreign words. I doubt that they are unfamiliar to you. And I want you to hear something that's very significant because what God has done, what Luke has done, here in this passage is he's connected these two ideas, right? Of them being righteous and seeking to walk in the way of the Lord, bearing the fruit of a, of a living life with God right next to barrenness. Right next to a, a desert place, a, a wilderness. It's almost like the what he's describing for us is the rough terrain of the political turmoil of Israel with Herod and all of that, the deep valleys, societal valleys that are going on. And he said, it's also true on the individual level. The rough places are really rough, and the deep valleys are really, really deep. And there's no hint of an idea here in this text that any of this barrenness has to do with some sin of Elizabeth. Right? Um, there's no hint at that. There's, there's maybe an idea that, that Herod's on the throne because of the societal sins of Israel. And we shouldn't discount the idea that our sins do have consequences in the world. But here in this passage, Elizabeth's barrenness has nothing to do with some like sin, prevailing sin in her life. And we just have to admit that this is true, that much of the hard, uh, what much of the difficulty that we go through in this life is simply that the world is not as it's meant to be. It's not. Paul tells us in Romans 8 that it groans to be set free from its bondage to corruption. And much of the hardship in your life, much of the barrenness that you experience, and the ache, the deep ache that you feel in this world, is simply this deep longing for the redemption of things, for things to be put to right. Now, some of this is aggravated even in the story of Zechariah in the temple. I mean, verse 18, one of the things that we is sort of mentioned there of Elizabeth says, and Zechariah said to the angel, <laughs> he's doubting even this presence of God, this messenger with him. How will I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. I mean, she's old. This pain, this barrenness has gone on a long time. I'm not even sure God can do something about it, is what he's saying. And then if we go down to verses 24 and 25, we learn a few things too. Verse 25, uh, it tells us that God has taken away 
her reproach among people. She was a reproach. Um, which is to say that she, she was, a, she was uh, an embodiment of a place of dishonor. Um, which is to say she wasn't honored in her community. Even though she was clearly a faithful woman to the Lord. Um, and specifically, it was tied to this idea that she didn't have children. That's why she wasn't in honor. She was a place of dishonor. But a place of dishonor or a place of reproach is also a place that is accompanied by disparaging speech. That's what reproach also means. Someone who, she's received disparaging speech. Um, and specifically, again, this is tied to the idea that she has not born children. Which sadly sounds like churches sometimes. Often the church doesn't honor the childless like we should, or singles as we should, or elderly as we should. I'll say this, I hope our church always honors you if you are in that place that often the church doesn't honor. But what Elizabeth is doing is she is voicing this dynamic of her life that has been a life of pain and sorrow, deeply rough places and unbelievably fathomable depths of sorrow. This is what Elizabeth is in this passage. A faithful woman who knows the Lord, who sought to bear the fruits of righteousness, and she knows the pain of this world intensely. The pain of things not being right, even her holy desires not being met. It's even highlighted for us, even when it says she's conceived in verse 24, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden. Why? Because nobody's going to believe her. She will be ridiculed. She'll be a place of reproach again. She'll be mocked and laughed at yet again. Friends, brothers and sisters, this is the passage that we are given before we are taught, told about Jesus. I mean, this is, this is in the great providence of God, what Luke writes for us before he even mentions the name of Jesus. And he's not just giving us history, you know, oh, I should tell you this thing that happened in their family about this woman and this man. It was kind of wild. There's all this incense in the temple and from an angel. He's giving us a theology. He's preparing us to understand how do we understand Jesus? Who is this Emmanuel, this God with us? What should we expect? Who's coming in this form of this little child? And what's he coming to do? Teaching us about the very coming of God. Preparing our hearts to receive him. Preparation for the good news, the gospel of Jesus. All right, let me mention the book of Kells, and then I'll wrap this up a little bit. So if you've seen, I would guess that many of you have actually at least seen pictures of this ancient, beautiful manuscript, this book of Kells. And maybe you've seen our beautiful gospel text that we have here, you know, read among us, picturing the incarnation. One of the wonderful things that you see when you look at this beautiful text of the Gospels is just how vibrant and colorful it is. I mean, you look at it and you go, wow, that's so beautiful how they made that R that began that sentence or something like It's just unbelievably colorful and ornate and it takes your breath away how beautiful it is. And you think, wow, especially if you've taken that long route to finally get to see it. You go, oh my goodness. This would have taken so long. This would have been such, such painstaking work to do this, to draw this, to paint this. But in some ways, it's even more amazing if you have any sense how ancient paint was made. Now, I'm a little reticent to get into this because I know a good number of you are painters, and I'm not. But as I looked it up, um, and as I thought about it, but then I looked it up, um, you know, ancient paints were made by crushing certain shells to get certain minerals with certain colors out or 
or taking certain plants and drying them out and then crushing them. Or digging up certain ground and finding certain things that could give you that exact color again. And then crushing it in order to make it lovely and beautiful and something that you could actually use. Or picking berries. And not leaving them just as berries, but smashing them. And getting in some ways the lifeblood out of them. Or quite literally, sometimes people would just paint with different blood for different colors. Dried up, ground, smeared. In some ways, death had to happen to make it really beautiful. To bring to life something that we were coming and looking at and awing over. And Elizabeth prepares us for Jesus in this, right? That he knows knows your deepest sorrow. He knows the long groaning of creation that you participate in. And I know we all participated in in it. And he's familiar with our deepest griefs we read in Isaiah. He's a man acquainted with sorrow and grief. He's coming into this world that's barren and not fruit giving and fruit bearing as it should be. But he also comes to make it lovely. He comes to actually make it right. And what that will entail is him entering into the deepest places of grief and sorrow and pain. What I'm suggesting to you is that even in this narrative of Elizabeth and Zechariah, what God is doing is he's preparing us. To notice that Jesus is the one and gives sight to the blind and heals the lame and forgives sins and brings in social outcasts. And he's ultimately the one who actually experiences sorrow upon sorrow himself in the cross and in the resurrection. This woman, in her barrenness, tells us God is coming into the world to right the wrongs of the world. To deal with the effects of sin. To meet your deepest desires. In the story of Elizabeth and her barrenness, we see the grace of God in Christ. We see the love of God for this world. We see Jesus' good news declared to all people. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. It's also an invitation, I think, to us uh, to bring before the Lord our deserts, our dry places, maybe our rough places and our deep valleys, and to know that none of it's lost on him. It's not. He comes to make the rough places plain, the valleys into level ground, to make all things as they should be. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful again for these women who prepare us to receive you rightly. Think of Tamar risking, wildly risking, to bring Judah to repentance. We think of the faith of Rahab the prostitute. who gave herself in your service and who has spared your judgment because of her faith. We think of Ruth, the Moabite, woman full of sorrow, Naomi, changing her name to Mara, bitterness, who's brought in and given life and joy in you, you, the great kinsman, redeemer. Think of Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. You have mercy on victims and victimizers. Think of Mary, the mother of Jesus. How is in the fullness of your time that you came? How is it the perfect time that you came? And God, now we think even of Elizabeth and this, this message that is so important for us. 
that our barrenness is not lost on you, that our deepest places where our hearts ache the most, you know that perfectly. And the wrongs of this world, whether whether they are due to sin or simply the long groaning of creation for things to be right, will be made right in Jesus. God, we bless you. We bless you for the gift of these women and these stories. We're thankful for Holy Scripture. God, in this Christmas season, may our hearts be full of joy and rejoicing. Because as the angels said long ago, you're bringing peace on earth through the gift of your Son. In his name we pray. Amen.